The only real difference between a UFC champion and a UFC prospect, between somebody that we think could be really good and somebody that is really, really good, is the ability to grow, is the ability to kind of, you know, develop your skill set. It's why we look at guys like Islam Makachev and we go, this guy's fucking incredible. He comes into the UFC as a wrestler with, you know, incredible jiu-jitsu, obviously coming from Dagestan. And now all of a sudden he's a kickboxer. Now he's, you know, really, really good on the feet. He's able to stand with some of the best guys in the entire UFC. It's why he's so, so, so impressed. So what I want to go through today is UFC contenders' biggest flaws, the biggest things that I think they need to patch up, the biggest thing that I think that they need to work on to become UFC champions, to become the elite of the elite inside the UFC. But before we get into it, please make sure to like, sub to the YouTube shit. It truly, truly does help me out a ton. Your one like pushes out to 100 more people with the click of a button. And I'm trying to see the numbers go up. So let's get right into it. The first guy that I want to talk about is Peyton Talbot. Peyton Talbot might be the most popular. He might be the guy that people think have the highest ceiling on this entire list when we're talking about UFC prodigies. And the answer for him might seem kind of simple, but it's actually not. I'm thinking about it kind of a different way to how I think most people are. When you see Peyton Talbot, okay, got phenomenal KO power, is a very, very, very good striker. So you kind of think to yourself, well, what does he need to get better at? The wrestling. Obviously, if he's not a good striker, he probably needs to get better at the wrestling. He probably needs to be, you know, at a decent level where wrestling isn't a big hole for him anymore. But I actually think the opposite of that. I think his wrestling is already pretty good. Like, his wrestling isn't bad right now. So I think that he needs to get better at striking. Because what we see inside the UFC now is that you have one thing that you're absolutely elite at. One thing that you're one of the best in the UFC at. And the rest of the stuff, you're pretty good at. I'm not sure right now if Peyton Talbot is the best striker in his division. And if he wants to become a champion, that's what he needs to be. He needs to be the best striker in his division if he's looking to take out a guy like Umar Namagamedov, who's going to be towards the top of the division, or Merab or Sean O'Malley. You truly need to be the best striker in the division, and then the wrestling will come from there. Then we need to get a little improvement. But for me, I need to see him go against an elite of the elite striker and see truly how good his striking is. Because in my eyes right now, I think that he is phenomenal potential in the striking, could be the best striker in the entire UFC. But we need to see him do it. We need to see him get better at the striking. We need to see improvements in the footwork and everything because KO power takes you a long, long way. Don't get me wrong. But it does not take you all the way. You still need to, you know, be able to do stuff against elite kickboxers that we've seen. You still need to be able to do it against a Sean O'Malley, someone like that who also has elite KO power. So I need to see Peyton Talbot, the technical stuff, the kind of small stuff in the striking, get a little bit better at that. And we also need to see him fight. We need to see him get a little bit, you know, more consistent. I know that he said that he's struggling for fights at 135, which kind of makes sense. Who the fuck's going to want to fight Peyton Talbot? But I do want to see him be that little bit more active if he can't be. If he can't be, it's whatever. It's not really his fault. After that, we have Vinicius Oliveira. Vinicius Oliveira is someone who has some of the craziest KOs in UFC history. Has, has like a crazy highlight reel already. If you don't know the name, you probably remember his flying knee KO over Bernardo Sopash, which happened in this year, but isn't going to win, you know, KO of the year, even though it very potentially could. Just obviously because you have Max Holloway against Justin Cagey this year. But he has a phenomenal highlight reel already. And the one thing that I don't want to see him do, because he's another great striker, another guy that you see KO power in every fucking limb in his body, good striking when he's on the feet, is willing to is willing and able to strike with really, really good strikers. But I need to see him to not fall in love with this KO power too. If you go back and you see, and you kind of like look at his losses, a lot of them, he's either winning by KO or losing by KO. There's not really a whole lot of, you know, decisions in there or him getting submitted or anything like that. And most of the time what it is, is that he hurts somebody. He goes in there, tries to get the kill, and then he gets hurt himself. And then he's on the back foot. And another thing for him, although he does have what, like 23 professional mixed martial arts fights, I feel like experience is a big thing for him. And experience is kind of that thing of, you know, don't rush in. As soon as you see a flicker of them hurt, don't rush in. Pick your shot. It's something that we see, I'm going back to Sean O'Malley, but it's something that we see Sean O'Malley do so unbelievably well. It's something that we see a lot of the great finishers do really, really well inside the UFC. They have you hurt and then they go in and they press you to the body and they set up that final shot, that final KO blow. Carlos Prades does it really, really well as well, who we're going to talk about in a minute. But for Vinicius Oliveira, I feel like the big things for him are experience, needs to get more fights, needs to fight more often, and then don't fall in love with the KOs. Don't fall in love with the KOs or your KO power, because sometimes it can get them in trouble. After that, we have Jean Silva. 
John Silva, very underrated at both 155 and 145. People are kind of starting to, you know, know the name now. People are kind of starting to, you know, kind of see him on fight cards and go, oh, yeah, yeah, John Silva, he's had one or two good fights, but the guy's a dog. The guy is real dog incarnate. When you win a UFC fight and you go up and you're barking in the mic, He's like, he's got everything that you need in terms of great for the UFC. There's no questions about that. In terms of getting tested in the UFC and how he'll do when he's tested, how he'll do under adversity, I have no real questions about that. My question for Jean Silva, and it's a question that pretty much every striker has, and Jean Silva, I wouldn't put him down as just purely a striker. I think he's a good mixed martial artist. Obviously, coming out of that fighting nerds camp, all of those guys are just elite mixed martial artists. But I want to see him against a high-level wrestler. I want to see him go up against a good wrestler because we've seen in the striking, he goes up against high level strikers and he's able to beat them and he's able to either beat them with the wrestling and hang on them on the feet. But I want to see him go up against the wrestler. I feel like it's very different in the UFC when you go up against a high level striker and a high level wrestler because high level wrestlers can legit ruin the entire fight. Even not very high level wrestlers. You go back to that Waldo Cortez Acosta and Rob Lee Spania fight, a not very high level wrestler held down an extremely high high level kickboxer, an extremely high level taekwondo fighter because he could not wrestle at all. So I need to see Jean Silva and I need to see how does he do in the wrestling when he goes up against one of those elite of the elite guys because 45 has them, 55 has them in fucking spades. You look at Armin, you look at Islam, you look at Miktebek. All of these guys, Miktebek might not be, you know, like on the same level as those guys, but he's still a very, very good wrestler. And Jean Silva, that's what I need to see. I need to see how does he do against those high level wrestlers? Can he still, you know, get up? Can he still impose himself on the feet? And can he win decisions, knock out elite level wrestlers? That's his biggest question. After that, we have Joe Anderson Brito. Joe Anderson Brito is my number one prospect in the UFC or was my number one prospect inside the UFC. After his last fight, I'm kind of rethinking that evaluation, but I still have him very high up there. I'm still buying all of the Joe Anderson Brito stock while it's low, but he's not perfect. No prospect is perfect. No UFC fighter in general is perfect, no matter how good some of them look. And he has some deficiencies that I think need to get worked out. And I think this loss could be one of the best things for him because he was better than William Gomez in my eyes. I think he got robbed in that fight. But even staying away from the robbery, staying away from all that type of shit, I think that he was bad in that fight. That was not a good Joe Anderson Brito that we saw. That was not the Joe Anderson Brito that we saw get a ninja choke in one of his first UFC fights. And I think what he needs to do is be more patient. It seemed like he was just kind of getting out there and he was like, I'm way better than this guy. I can finish this guy. And he just rushed everything. He, you know, went out there, tried to, you know, knock him out, tried to take him down, tried to do everything. And if I was him, my biggest thing is be more technical. He is a guy that is a technically good fighter, if you know what I mean. Like when you watch his striking, when you watch his wrestling, you'd never really go out there and say that like he's super, super sloppy or that he isn't a good mixed martial artist but I need to see him be more technical. I need to see him kind of go in there with a technical approach and try and take people apart because that kind of super heavy pressure cardio style works to a certain level, works to a certain standard. But now when you start to get towards the rankings, especially in a division like 145 that's stacked, you're going to go up against guys that know how to counter that. You're going to go up against guys that will be, you know, better than just losing to the pressure, better than just losing to someone walking them down 24-7 and will be able to piece you apart and that's Joanna Sembrito's biggest flaw. We need to see him be more tactical. We need to see him rush less. And I'm still super high on him. I still think that he's a top five prospect inside the UFC. And while other people might be down after that William Gomez loss, I'm staying strong. I'm staying strong in the Joanna Sembrito camp. After that, we have Carlos Prades. Carlos Prades, who I was talking about a little bit before, he's someone that's burst onto the UFC scene. Burst onto the UFC scene, got a great personality too. Another one of those kind of Brazilians that comes through and just has a super likable personality, just has super likable traits. I don't know how the fuck they do it. It's weird, but it works every single time. And for him, the biggest thing that he needs is wrestling. It's kind of simple. It's like, he's a great striker. We've seen the striking. Have we seen him against elite guys? No, but we've seen that that KO power is going to carry. If you go up against a guy like Li Jing Liang and you're able to knock him out, you're able to knock someone that's never been finished in the UFC, who's a UFC vet that has never been finished in the UFC before and you're able to finish him, that KO power is, it's going to carry. It's going to carry into the top 10. It's going to carry into the top 15. It's going to carry through all of those guys. So I don't really have any problems with his power and the striking I think is good, but we haven't seen him wrestle. He's kind of got not favorable matchups, but he's gotten matchups that I think are very, very winnable for him. And I want to see him go out there and have to wrestle, even, even defensively wrestling. Offensively wrestling, I don't really mind too much. If he's not the greatest offensive wrestler ever, hmm, like, I don't really care. 
But the defensive wrestling, we do need to see that. We need to see how good his defensive wrestling is. We need to, you know, just make sure, kind of take off that box. And I'd like to see him in a matchup against, I don't know, maybe a Neil Magny soon, maybe a Jeff Neal, somebody like that. Because Neil Magny will test your wrestling. Neil Magny will go out there and, you know, test. If you can't do something correctly, Neil Magny will find it out. So I think that Carlos Pattis deserves that step up towards the rankings. But we also need to not rush him too fast because there is holes that we haven't seen be filled yet. After that, we have Joe Pfeiffer. Joe Pfeiffer, one of the guys that I was highest on coming into the UFC this year. Super, super high on Joe Pfeiffer. Love Joe Pfeiffer as a prospect. His problem is something that I need to see fixed. I need to see fixed, and it might be the biggest problem and the hardest problem to fix out of anybody on this list. With Joe Pfeiffer, it's his fight IQ. Joe Pfeiffer's fight IQ is a problem for him. It is a big, big problem. And the thing about fight IQ is that that's a difficult thing to fix. Striking, there's striking drills. Wrestling, there's wrestling drills. Listen, if you wrestle for six months, for a year, for a year and a half straight, your wrestling will become better. But the problem is, for Joe Pfeiffer, if you can't, you know, adjust inside the cage, it's going to be very difficult because he's a phenomenal athlete and he might be the greatest pub stomper we've ever seen in UFC history. And what I mean by that is if you put the guy inside fucking, you know, like cage rage or inside Invicta or something, he will legitimately look like Jesus inside a ring, Jesus inside an octagon, just because he's so much more athletic than everybody else. He's so much more explosive than everybody else. He has KO power. He has a crazy highlight reel when he's beating up guys that, you know, are weekend warriors, train once or twice a week and then they go in there and fight Joe Pfeiffer. But we need to see him do it against crafty vets, like a Jack Hermanson. Jack Hermanson, not a UFC champion, not UFC champion caliber, but a good UFC fighter, a good gatekeeper inside the UFC. You look at some other people that are going to be at that 185 pound division, lots of guys there. You look at Chris Curtis, another guy that's kind of in that same bracket. You look at Brendan Allen, who I think it probably has a higher ceiling than both of those guys, but Brendan Allen, another guy that's just go out there and is just going to be able to win. So for Joe Pfeiffer, I need to see him adjust. And the only way that you can do that is if you're fighting against a good fighter. So Joe Pfeiffer fighting a bum and knocking him out in one round doesn't matter to me. All we need to see is Joe Pfeiffer against high-level competition. After that, we have Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel is pretty much the only competition to Peyton Talbot in terms of the most popular guy, in terms of the guy that has the highest ceiling on this list. And for Bo Nickel, you have the game plan laid out for you. You have the blueprint in another fighter that's been laid out for you and how to win, and how to become a UFC champion, and how to become a pound for pound number one. That's Islam Makachev. Islam Makachev came into the UFC as someone who could not strike very well. Striking was a little bit better than Bo Nichols, yes, but who could not strike very well. Had that elite wrestling. Had that Dagestani wrestling. And if I'm Bo Nickel, we don't need to work on that all that much. I truly don't think so. Make sure that, you know, it stays at the high level that it's at. Make sure it doesn't get any worse. But if I was Bo Nickel, I wouldn't be tacking too much onto my wrestling game. I would be heavily investing in the striking, heavily investing in the striking. Because if he can get to a point where he's a competent striker, where it's not a huge hole for him, he's going to be very difficult to beat. Very, very, very difficult to beat. Because we've seen the wrestling. We've seen from guys like the, the blueprints even there, Henry Cejudo. Olympic gold medalist, Daniel Cormier, Olympic wrestler, and he might be a better wrestler than all of those guys. So the blueprint is there. He just needs to improve the striking. He needs to look at what Islam Makachev has done inside the UFC and go, that's what I need to do. That's the blueprint. And how do I get it done? Then we have Mauricio Rufi. Mauricio Rufi, another one of those elite strikers. There's so many elite strikers coming out of fighting nerds coming out of Brazil right now. Like, it's legit probably the most talented gym on the planet. When you look at, like, pound for pound, how many guys they have inside the UFC compared to how many, like, elite guys they have inside the UFC, they, they're they all elite. They all look super, super good. They all come in with fantastic records. They all come in super well prepared. But for him, he's 10-1. and 1, And 10-1 and 1 is a great record. And he looked fantastic against Jamie Malarkey. He had a fight against Jamie Malarkey. That kind of opened my eyes to Marisha Rufi. And I was like, oh, this guy's fucking, this guy's good. He's really, really good. He shocked me in that because Jamie Malarkey's not a bad UFC fighter. And he's a finish in every single fight. So he has that kind of, you know, that fast track thing that the UFC will give him. If you finish every fight, the UFC are going to push you very, very fast. If you can become a fan favorite early, Marisha Rufi's already on that track. The UFC can push you very, very fast. But I don't want them to push him too fast. I think he needs to be conservative in what fights he takes. Because not only is he 10-1, and 1, 
which is not a lot of fights, especially when we're considering guys that are in the UFC. But he's also got finishes in pretty much all of them. He's never been tested before. He does have a loss via KO, which like the ability to come back from a loss is a big thing. And that's a good thing. But we've never seen him in deep waters. We've never seen him inside, you know, that third round, that fourth round, that fifth round of, say, a regional promotion where he's 25 minutes through a fight and he still has to keep going, where he's in that 20th minute and the bell goes to that fifth round and he needs to win it. We haven't seen that. So I think he needs to take his time in the UFC because also the wrestling, we haven't seen it. Like, when you KO everybody or get KO'd, you, you, we're not going to see a lot of wrestling. He's getting first round KOs against guys in promotions that should never be inside the octagon with Mauricio Rufi. So if I was him, I would, you know, just take it slow, take it calm, go fight by fight, get the levels up bit by bit and not rush myself too quick. And then finally, we have someone who I think is probably the most underrated guy inside the entire UFC. And that is Basil Hafez. Basil Hafez, you may know the name because he went life and death with Jack Della Maddalena. And people were like, oh shit, Jack Della Maddalena actually didn't look good in that fight. For someone who was a super hot prospect, he didn't look great against Basil Hafez. But I think Basil Hafez is just really, really good. The problem for him is the complete opposite to Mauricio Rufi. He's 32. We know about those stats about once you hit 35. And he's nowhere near even the rankings yet. He's had, you know, that loss to Jack Della Maddalena. He's beat Mickey Gall. He has another fight coming up against Oban Elliott, which, you know, that's a very winnable fight. You should a thousand percent win that fight. But he's in a battle against time. He needs to get a bit of hype behind him. He needs to get a bit of a push behind him before we even think, is he decent? Before we even think, is he good? Because I think he's very underrated. I think he's a very good fighter right now. From what I've seen from that Jack Della Maddalena fight, to be able to stifle someone like that in the striking, to be able to wrestle really, really well against someone who we've now seen against Gilbert Burns is not a bad wrestler. That's very impressive. So he's in a battle against time and he needs some hype behind him and to take some good fights very, very soon. But that is every single UFC prodigy's biggest flaw, their biggest problem and how they can become a UFC champion. Make sure to like, sub, dollar, YouTube channel. I'll catch all your boys tomorrow.